Hello, everyone. Hello, Lisbon. Hello, all the world. My name is Pedro. I'm a journalist, and I'm very pleased to be the moderator of the following panels. Just this morning, uh, we heard the co-founder of Planeteers, Sergio Ribeiro, tell, uh, tells us that no matter what adversities we face, we must not give up, we must strive. And so he said, we must take decisions based on hope. And that means not only having ideas and believing in our, our values and common values, but also to put at place business models, to invest, to um, reach for financing those investments. And this, in this next panel, we will be talking about financing, we will be talking about investing, and we will be talking about regenerative investing with John Fullerton, who, who will be with us remotely. Uh, John spent 20 years of his lifetime working in Wall Street in an investment bank, uh, JP Morgan. Um, he was working in capital markets, it was working with derivatives all over the world. So maybe we may say that he has met a part of the dark side. And then he left. In 2001, he founded Capital Institute. He is now the president of Capital Institute. Um, and Capital Institute is dedicated to reimagining economics and finance in service to life. So John is the architect of uh, regenerative economics, uh, the concept that he first conceived in a booklet published in 2015 on how universal patterns and principles will shape the new economy. So John is what we may call an unconventional economist. He's an impact investor, he's a writer, and he certainly is a thinker. Some people say that is a philosopher. So John, thank you very much uh, to be with us today. And I'll pass on to you. And hopefully, we will talk a little uh, in the end. You may make, make questions on the chat. And I'll be very happy to pose them to John. Thank you very much, John. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Pedro, for that great introduction. And, and it's a pleasure to be with you all from my hotel room here. homeless and and uh, so I uh, would much rather be with you all there and live in a city that I, I love uh, greatly. Uh, Jonathan, um, uh, we're not hearing quite uh, uh, quite well. Uh -oh. um, okay, it feels it, it, that better. It's fine. Thank you. Yeah. And and uh, is, are my slides? I can't see. Uh, if my slides are up, I guess they are. So, um, uh, as I said, it's a pleasure to be with you, and, and um, I really enjoyed the, the last panel and the conversation about uh, the many uh, entrepreneurs that are out solving problems. And what I would like to do is, is propose the idea that the reason it feels like we have so many problems to solve is that they're all rooted in a flawed economic system and as a result of a flawed economic system, a flawed understanding of the role of finance. And so what we're doing is we're chasing problems that are actually the symptoms of a, of a flawed system design. And the journey toward a regenerative economy and regenerative investment is really um, uh, the journey to a reimagine a new system uh, as as radical and profound as that sounds. And I've come to believe, after thinking about these issues and problems for now nearly 20 years, that we are on the cusp of, of a system transition, even though many of us uh, don't quite see it yet. Now, um, uh, the, the, the world of, of impact investment was profoundly um, triggered in many ways by this idea of a triple bottom line uh, that John, uh, John Elkington, who's pictured there, first came up, first coined the term over 20 years ago. 
And so the investment community has been exploring this idea of not just investing for financial return, but for investing uh, for a triple bottom line, meaning financial profits, but also positive impact on the environment and positive social impacts. And what's important about this idea is that John himself issued a product recall on it a couple of years ago in an article he wrote in the Harvard Business Review. And, and the reason he did that is he realized that simply, simply um, adding two other dimensions to a, to a theory uh, of optimizing returns was, was not getting us where we needed to go. And as, as was discussed on the prior panel, it just seems like things aren't moving in the right direction fast enough. And, and I think he's right. And in fact, if you, if you sort of go up to 30,000 feet and, and think about not just investment, but of all of economics, um, I would only point out that we awarded a Nobel Prize in economics in 2018 to an economist who developed a model that calculated that the optimal global warming target was three and a half degrees Celsius. And the reason for that is that anything lower would cause too much destruction of growth and therefore cost too much. So think about that. We've got a, a broad scientific consensus that says that unless we keep global warming to one and a half degrees, uh, we will essentially destroy life on this planet as we know it. And yet the Nobel Prize in economics, not 20 years ago, but two years ago, was awarded to an economist who developed a model that said three and a half degrees is the optimal target. And that gives you the, an idea of how broken our economic ideology really is. Um, so what I've been uh, working on over the last 10, 20 years is this idea of regenerative economics. And it's a simple hypothesis, which is that living systems, uh, nature has proven to be sustainable. And the scientists who study living systems uh, can define how those systems work and what patterns and principles define healthy living systems. And the idea of regenerative economics is simply that the human economy needs to behave like a living system as it's made up of humans, which are living systems themselves. And, uh, and, and what, we, what we find if we, if we make that assertion is that in fact, many things about the way our economy works are in fact degenerative, not regenerative. And this movement that we're all a part of now is this gradual uh, move from conventional degenerative mechanistic thinking uh, born of, of the modern age, not, not intentionally bad, but, but limited in its understanding, uh, moving toward green and, and this idea that we can get to sustainable by doing things less bad. But in fact, in living systems, including in our own bodies, uh, our bodies are regenerating all of us during this conference. Uh, otherwise, we're not here. And, and so sustainability for a, any living system is really the outcome of this regenerative process over on the right. And the regenerative process demands holistic thinking rather than reductionist thinking. It's more about patterns than parts. And it's ultimately organized around the idea of living systems. That's, that's the key. And I've um, written a paper about this, um, as Pedro mentioned, in 2015, where I articulate eight principles of a regenerative economy. And before we can get to investment, we need to understand what we're investing for. And uh, one of the principles that I articulate is this idea of right relationship. Uh, everything in a living system is in symbiotic relationship with the other parts, creating uh, creating a whole that is more healthy than any of the than the sum of the individual parts, and finance and investment needs to understand its relationship with the economy, which is in service to the economy. And the problem with finance and the problem with derivatives and the dark side that Pedro introduced me with is that we've used that these technologies uh, to extract as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to invest and to create regenerative health for the whole system. So I don't have time to go through all these principles now, but they, anyone familiar with living systems will recognize these ideas as descriptors of how or qualities of how living systems work. And what I've tried to do with the idea of investment is place the evolution of, of investment thinking on this same uh, pathway toward a regenerative world. And so over on the left, you see 
uh, the very conventional things, you know, the, where the bulk of the capital in this on this world is invested in passive index funds, leveraged buyout funds, activist investors uh, who are extracting from companies in order to create optimizing financial return alone. And uh, and then as you move toward the right, you see things like active and engaged um, uh, environmental, social, and governance uh, strategies. These are all directionally positive and, and certainly a good thing, but I would argue only until we get into this field of impact investing and, and some green bonds are impact investing where you're, you're engaged in a direct relationship with a company and your purpose is to uh, generate both a financial return, but also some other positive impact whether it's in education or in the environment or in, in inclusive um, uh, uh, communities. And, and the purpose of the investment is actually uh, has a holistic health uh, objective in mind. It's not simply to make money or to maximize the return on, on investment. And as you go further over into the right, um, I believe we're just at the cusp and the beginning stage of what truly regenerative investment is all about. One of the principles of a regenerative economy is, is, in my language, honors community in place. Living systems occur in a place where the context, human culture, and, and geologic reality intersect. So that would suggest that place-based investing is aligned with this regenerative paradigm. And we're seeing a, a growing res, uh, interest in place-based investing. And ultimately, uh, the idea of integral capital means that one, one invests in a project where the benefits uh, for the system as a whole are far la larger than the benefits to the investor directly. And I have a couple of examples of that um, that I'm going to talk about. And then finally, on the far upper right, this is really just a, pr a prov provocation for the idea that the system we've created has been wonderfully designed to optimize the growth of financial capital but increasingly at the expense of natural capital, the environment, and increasingly social capital, uh, to just use a generic term for all of the human, um, uh, human well-being issues that we're confronting. So we're, we're running around trying to fix these problems when in fact the system itself is systematically creating these problems because of its design. So we, we, uh, we extract financial capital through our investment activity and that leaves the need to deal with the environmental damage and the social damage that's left in its wake. And ultimately, I believe we've created this mountain of financial capital at the expense of the uh, natural um, um, uh, you know, bounty of natural capital that this planet has. And we're in a state where for the rest of our lifetimes, we're going to need to be regenerating that natural capital and increasingly regenerating the social capital that has been destructed as a result of uh, the unintended consequences in most cases of our economic system. And that will call for a whole new um, uh, understanding of the role of philanthropy to be not a problem solving band-aid, but a systemic transfer of wealth from financial capital back into natural and social capital. And we're only only at the beginning of that, but it, it'll involve uh, a massive rethinking of the purpose of capital itself. Um, I got to find my, sorry. Um, so what does this mean in the, in the real world? I mean, let me, um, let me slide. Here we go. Is that working? Sorry, my clicker seems a little technical difficulty. There we go. So what does this mean or look like in the real world? Well, again, um, uh, going back to the, the prior conversation about technology, um, you know, I believe that the, the, the role of real investment, um, this is not financial speculation, buying and selling stocks and bonds. This is real investment in real projects, whether they're social entrepreneurs building solutions to the social issues, as we heard about in the last panel, or the construction of solar wind farms, uh, or the building of real businesses that solve uh, and address the pressing problems that we face. All of the capital that's invested to create this, re this new real economy uh, is, in a sense, the bridge to the regenerative future we need. 
And that, that requires thinking about investment, not just as individuals, but the investment capital of businesses, obviously the investment capital of large institutional investors, and importantly, the investment uh, capital of governments, which are a massive investor in the real economy. Uh, we, need a, a, we need to do this around a, a set of shared values. I think that goes without saying, but unfortunately in this world, uh, the values uh, that, that are driving investment are not uh, aligned toward the common good. Um, it requires a new way of seeing, a holistic way of seeing, rather than seeing in a reductionist modern age view. We need to see things as a, as a, as a whole system. Uh, and we need to align our technology choices uh, with this way of thinking. Now, for my own investment portfolio, I've completely uh, rejected modern portfolio theory. Uh, I don't have time to go into it here today, but modern portfolio theory is built on a foundation of flawed assumptions, bad statistics, and it's, it's not useful in a world of interconnected, nonlinear uh, reality. And the financial crises we've had over the last uh, several decades are proof to that. They show that the models we use work in, in normal times, but then they stop working uh, when you need them the most. Um, something, sorry about the uh, technology glitches here. Now, with respect to, you know, getting this very concrete in the real world, obviously everyone knows about the importance of renewable energy. So I'm not gonna talk about it here today, but I have a significant amount of my own investment portfolio invested in mostly public companies that are building out the renewable infrastructure. These cash flows are very, very resilient, which I think is important in the uh, times we're gonna be living in, but also they're aligned with the energy transition that's needed. Um, what's less well known and to me very fascinating is not the, uh, the essential need to transition the energy system to stop releasing carbon, but we need to also regenerate the natural systems that absorb carbon. And few people are aware that the natural, uh, the, the carbon sink represented by the world's grasslands is the second largest carbon sink after the ocean, comparable to the, the world's forests. And what we've done with our uh, destructive, degenerative in industrial agriculture, and by the way, this is true whether we use, you know, more efficient te techniques to reduce the amount of water and reduce the amount of fertilizer, we've converted massive swaths of perennial grasslands into annuals that in the process release carbon from uh, the world's soil. The thing about perennial grasses is that they have very deep re roots and, and the photosynthetic process brings carbon and sequesters it permanently in the ground. And the science on this is, is accelerating rapidly. It's one of the most exciting areas in the whole climate challenge. And I've co-founded a company that is involved in managing ranch land in a holistic way, which leaves the outcome you see in this picture on the right, rather than the outcome you see on the left. And it doesn't take a scientist to think that if, if uh, healthy grasses means building soil and building soil means sequestering carbon, we'd much rather ra we'd, we would much rather manage ranch land uh, the way it's done on the right than on the left. And that uh, approach is what got me onto this idea of regeneration in the first place. Um, so how else can we sequester carbon uh, in the grasslands beside the way we manage uh, large herbivores on it? Well, I'm involved in another initiative called Waterfield Farms, which is uh, growing in tanks in a very sustainable way, uh, tilapia fish. Tilapia happen to eat um, grass as their core uh, diet. They don't need corn and they don't eat, need to eat grain. And so the entire poultry industry has been developed uh, with genetic enhancements that you see that have raised, grown the size of chickens on the left, but importantly, on the basis of a grain diet, which makes no sense because if we grow grains, it means we convert prairies of, of grasses into annual crops of grains, which means we, we trigger this destructive process that releases carbon into the atmosphere. And so we turn the second largest carbon sink into a source of carbon that's on, the scale, on a similar scale as the burning of fossil fuels. And yet, if we just try to solve the problem of climate change without seeing the systemic root causes of it, which is the destruction of the massive carbon sinks we have, 
we'll never we'll never get to the to the end goal. We we you know we're at whatever 415 parts per million. We need to get to below 350. So if we turned off all the fossil fuel emissions today, we still have this massive need to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. And by developing an industry of grass-fed fish that will eat grass pellets, we create a systemic positive feedback loop where the more these fish are, are consumed uh, and, they're, and they're grown locally in, in modest scale uh, fisheries. And I, I'll, again, I could talk long about how, how interesting the, the business model is. They, they use um, uh, much more efficient use of feed. So the cost of these fish can actually be, can compete with chicken once we're, we're at a, a reasonable scale. But the key to it is that it's done on the back of, of feed that is grass, which triggers the demand for farmers to grow grass rather than to grow grains. And so here's an example of a regenerative investment in a company. And it's not about the investment. It's about the company and the entrepreneur who has figured this out. And he's been involved in living systems uh, throughout his career. Uh, he is, is optimistic that we can improve the genetics of tilapia fish as well to compete with the growth rate of chickens and, and ultimately have protein, a protein source that's cheaper than chickens, but with this positive impact on the, uh, on the environment. Um, this isn't just an idea that relates to um, uh, agriculture, however. Uh, if we think about the business model of technology companies and just start with the, the technology of the internet itself, one of the principles of regenerative systems is robust circulation. So as we've been discussing, uh, the internet is a massive tool that is aligned with the, the, the shift toward a regenerative world. It massively accelerates the circulation of information and the circulation of empathy. Um, but that doesn't mean every business that's built on the internet is regenerative. And in fact, I would suggest that Facebook in, in extracting data from its users and selling it to the highest bidder and Amazon with its extractive um, business practices for its own employees, as well as its suppliers is, is using technology in a very degenerative way just as derivatives was ultimately used in a very degenerative way, but it's not a degenerative technology. However, there are plenty of companies, technology companies, uh, starting with Cisco, who itself is in a sense, I think their, their logo is the people who brought you the internet, uh, but they sell kit that's essential to cr the creation of the internet, which is this very positive regenerative uh, technology. And companies like Alibaba and Shopify uh, are there in service of their customers as opposed to extracting from their users. So again, the, the ethics and the, and the worldview on how we use technology determines whether a business model is, is regenerative or not. And uh, I'll just close with a, um, a quote from uh, Buckminster Fuller, who uh, the last published work that he, that he did before he died was a book called Grunch, and it was really his critique of capitalism. And, and it kind of blew my mind when I read it because it was long after I had been on this journey. And so I, I felt very comfortable that, that I was really just extending and thinking about ideas that many, many before me going all the way back to Goethe have, have been thinking about. This is really nothing new about this thinking. And, and Bucky says, uh, nature is a totally efficient self-regenerating system. If we discover the laws that govern this system and live synergistically within them, sustainability will follow. In other words, sustainability is the outcome of regeneration and humankind will be a success. And that's what I think, that's what my uh, work is dedicated to. And it's been a pleasure to share this with you and hopefully we have some time for, for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for your wonderful uh, presentation. Let me just start for this last slide that you showed us uh, on uh, Mr. Fuller's uh, uh, phrase. It was, it, uh, he said that uh, almost 30 years ago. So have we been discovering the laws uh, which, he meant, which he refers to? Are we on that process? You know, if you study living science, uh, there's a, there's a, I wouldn't call it a consensus, but there is a, a strong and deep understanding of how living systems work and whether they would be called laws or more like qualities or patterns. 
um, maybe there'd be some debate, but but really this this is a revolution in our understanding of of, of science. Um, you know, the the um, uh, Lynn Margolis and um, uh, I'm blanking on his name. Um, I'll think of it in a second. But the the whole idea of Gaia theory, the idea that the planet itself is a living system was radical and profound and laughed at when it was first introduced back around probably the same time. Um, but increasingly, I think the idea that the planet itself is a living system is um, is increasingly accepted in science. You were very persuasive on uh, on the need of moving from uh, the generative uh, through um, regenerative uh, economy and, and investing. But are you convinced that it will happen? Are you hopeful, optimistical on, on that process? You know, I, I am hopeful. Um, I, I, I can tell you uh, this, is, this is something that is an emergent process. It's not going to happen because you know, we logically decide, okay, let's make this shift. It's actually going to happen because the pressures to force us to make this shift are growing. And I've been on this regenerative bandwagon now pretty intensely for almost a decade. And suddenly now, uh, uh, this idea is, is kind of emergent in a, in a profound way. Just a couple examples. So Walmart has just announced that it's going to become a regenerative company. Now, I'm not sure what they mean by that, but I never would have predicted that even nine months ago. And in, in a strange way, I actually believe the pandemic has accelerated the future into the present in many, many ways, um, including I'm not jumping on an airplane to come be with you all. I'm doing this conference um, uh, remotely here. Uh, but another way is that, you know, the, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's, it's what exponential means, the power of the exponential function. And so it's, it doesn't, it, it's, not, it's not strange to me that we've been forced to focus on exponential functions right at a time when the exponential function of finance is what's driving us off a cliff in terms of climate change, because it's this exponential growth on a finite planet, which is not a new idea, that was well articulated in the 1970s in a, in a famous book called Limits to Growth, but we've not listened to what we understood back in the 1970s. And, and simple basic physics tells us that the exponential growth of the material throughput of our human economy, meaning resources in and waste out, can't continue with a planet that's not expanding. And that, that simple reality uh, undermines every theory about economic intent that we hold as true. And so I think to answer your question, I think it's not so much that, you know, me or my colleagues are going to persuade people of this, but that it becomes self-evident and the pressures grow, just like the pressure. If you turn up the heat under a pot of water, eventually it boils. You don't need to convince it to boil. The pressure is what causes it to boil. And I think that's the world. I think that's happening in this decade would be my best guess. And yes, I remain hopeful that we will, not without pain and not a lot of suffering, but we will work our way through this. Let's hope so. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for your presence and for being with us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.